ferocious, doesn't it? Well, it's just a bear rug, captures the fascination of a lot of people, and it's a part of the hunt, a part of the trophy that a hunter brings home from bear hunting. Also, the meat is great. We have a great recipe coming up, and the adventure of bear hunting can't be equaled by hunting any other animal in this state. It's a dangerous animal. Fortunately, it's fairly secretive. That makes it tough to film. This has been one of our toughest assignments, but we went around Lake Gogebic, just south of Lake Gogebic, to Gonzo Bear Camp. We got some slides of our bear hunt. Later in the week, we went over around Newberry to get the bear footage you just saw. We'll explain about that, about bears, bear hunting, a good bear recipe, so stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night. We're going bear hunting on Michigan Outdoors. I wonder how many people who are watching right now have bought something at this store, the Deer Trail Country Store on US 2, just west of Waters Meat. Must have been a few years ago. I wonder if anyone watching has spent a night in one of these little overnight cabins next to the store. You know, the UP has a number of historic reminders of an era gone by. Even the sign promoting the little town of Marinisco shows signs of age and weather. And the town itself, well, we're looking down the main drag. It's quite small. They tell me smaller than it was many years ago. The western UP, by the way, gets quite a bit of rain, more than the eastern UP. That's the way it was the first week of bear season. We saw plenty of rain. There's a little sign along US 2 indicating you've arrived at the bear camp. Now, the weather really didn't change this fast, but taking the two-track into the bush brings you to the little encampment of bear hunters that was named Gonzo a few years ago when Ted Nugent spent some time hunting with Dale Gray and Bob Putnam, the organizers of what they now call the Gonzo Bear Camp. Some hunters, like this group from the Flint Bowman, brought their own accommodations. The rest of us stayed in a rustic log cabin that was over 100 years old. Coat rack is on the outside, and all the bunks are on the inside. Where's the electricity? Right here, a portable generator that lights up a few bulbs, enough for 20 hunters in a bear camp. Now, bear hunting is only done by the Gonzo camp in the evenings. So during the day, there's time for archery practice or even making arrowheads, which is Norm Blaker's specialty. He always draws a crowd. We've had Norm on Michigan Outdoors before, chipping flint arrowheads with a piece of deer antler, the way Indians made their hunting equipment many years ago. Norm hunts with these arrowheads using a long bow, and over the years, he's taken a remarkable amount of game with this primitive equipment. Another aspect of bear camp that's definitely on the primitive side is the bait. Every day when the hunters leave for their blinds, each one takes a bucket to dump in front of his blind. What's in these buckets? Well, a mixture of leftovers from slaughterhouses and groceries, nothing we really want to dwell on, but bears are attracted to it. Bob Putnam spends many weeks before the season opens setting up baits which he hopes will attract bears on, on somewhat of a regular basis. Returning to the bait with a bow in the evening is the most common way of hunting at the Gonzo Bear Camp. But Bob Garner, you are a dog man, and you prefer the thrill of the chase. No, oh, I love it. And bear guides Rick Hinman of New Lothrop and Mark Scudder of Ada invited me to hunt bear with them over their pack of plot hounds. This big plot by the name of Sounder is Rick's favorite dog for rigging. Now, a rig dog sits on a platform on the hood and uses its nose to locate bear scent on or near the road. Rick and Mark also use two more dogs on top of the pickup box to confirm the rig dog, or they can pick up scent that the rig dog might have missed. When a bear scent is found, Rick walks Jenny into the strike the track. When a line is struck, the rest of the pack is released. All dogs now are equipped with radio transmitters. Through the aid of a receiver and directional antenna, strayed or lost dogs can be found easily enough so that the necessity to leave, you know, so that you might have to leave a dog in the woods, well, that's gone. While we had one bear chase the day I hunted with Rick and Mark, Fred, my tag is still not filled, uh, a fact I guess I'll have to bear with until next season. I certainly hope you won't hound us with all those bad oh. puns all year, Bob. And although we didn't take bear, two hunters did on opening day, Dave Blaker and Erwin Ketzler. And when these were skinned out by Dale Gray, using a knife which Norm Blaker chipped from Flint, again an Indian tool. And Dale said the serrated edge worked as well, if not better, than his steel hunting knife for skinning. Now, Dave Blaker was most interested in his trophy on the table, not the wall, so he spent quite a while trimming all the fat off the carcass, which will leave, believe it or not, tender and tasty meat. And my story of opening day over a bait was every bit as exciting. That's the bait for my tree stand. The woods were dark, so my pictures weren't the best, but a little bit after 6 p.m., I saw a bear coming towards the bait. 
its rear end right there by the tree in the middle. You can see that black portion. He's right in the middle of the picture. And this bear came into the bait three times. The first time I just watched quietly. The second time I took these slides. He let me do it, but it was a small bear and I wanted to watch it work the bait rather than shoot it. It was fascinating. Not many hunters get to watch bears work a bait, see them come and go, but this bear gave me a real education as to what bears really do when they're in the woods working a bait. Because of the difficulties involved in bear hunting, the only practical way to recreate this for you is to go to the eastern end of the UP with Chuck Godfrey, the owner of Boo Boo. That's a 300 pound wild black bear that is semi-tame. You've seen him on the show and at the outdoor fair and he'll premiere again in a few minutes in the woods near Newberry at Chuck's Country Boy Bear Camp. And these are bear woods. In fact, many swamps in the northern lower peninsula and UP contain bears. The question is, where do you hunt them and why do you put a bait in a location like this? It's secluded and it's, it's dark and back, you know, it's like in a valley and it's awful dark back in there where it's uh, brushy and well, is this, are the these, ideal. This is a mixture of uh, spruce, pine, aspen, uh, hardwoods, maple. Does it matter what type of... Well, the, uh, natural food. Like there's a lot of berries along the path and some beech nuts and hazelnuts uh, all through this area. Where would, the, where would the bears be during the day? Oh, out in the swamp laying or up in the brush like that, that area there where it's real thick. They like to lay where it's thick. And they'll uh, spend most of the day laying down or? Yeah, just maybe picking berries if there's berries in the area, you know, and uh, come to the bait in the afternoon or in the evening. Let's grab the bait here. We're going to go back and bait the stand. You just follow us along, Oge. Uh, this did this look to you like a bear had been using the area, or did it look like an area that you could attract a bear to? One, well, I could attract a bear to with the, the natural food. Uh, uh, there, I hadn't seen no sign here. Okay, characteristic of, of bait here. Here's a spot that, that you've baited before, and what, what is this here? It's uh, smoked meat and molasses and some bread. It's uh, kind of, this here is is getting old, it needs to be freshened. Uh, would a bear be interested in, in in rotted meat that is this old? Some bears, you know, like if they're real hungry, I've had them eat this kind, but most of them, when you're feeding them regular, they won't uh, they won't eat that kind of bait. Okay, so this is this is the stuff. Would you get rid of this or put this on top of it? What are put we it right do? on top of there. It's okay. good for the scent, you know. This is. Go ahead and dump it out. Yeah. What is it? It's smoked pig skins, and I have tripes, and but mostly this here, I don't guess I ain't got a tripe in there, but it's smoked pig skins. It's uh, about like bacon rind or something. It's, well, it does it. It smells sweet. Is that molasses or something yeah, in there? there's molasses dumped over some of it, and some I don't. Usually in season, I put molasses on it. Okay, now cover cover the bait with logs, right? Now, what's the purpose of this? Just so you can tell if the bear's been hitting it? Yeah, and uh, keep the, the ravens and everything from eating your bait. Everything in the, in the woods will eat your bait. The ravens and coyotes hit it sometimes. And mm -hmm. if something eats a bait before the bear gets there, it uh, don't do you much good. Okay, so this is what you'd call a, a good <clears throat> setup. Take the bucket back out. Mm -hmm. here's and a, Here's a better log to, so you know a bear has to move it. You know, nothing, okay. nothing can move it but a bear. Pile it up like that. And how often would a bear come to this? Well, different baits have, some baits have bears coming every other day or some, very few every day. Mm -hmm. And some only once or twice a week will hit a bait. Uh, okay, another thing, come on up here, OJ, we can look up. Uh, another technique you use for at least attracting a bear to an area initially is hanging tripe right here on the tree. Uh huh. What else, what else could somebody hang in a tree? Anything? Any? Oh, yeah, something that's going to spoil or give off a lot of smell. Now, you could use the smoked meat, but it don't, those when they're, when they're uh, real fresh will call bears for a long ways. Mm -hmm. They might not eat it. They might never touch it. They will sure come to it. Uh, 
Well, bears are real scavengers. Bears are scavengers. They eat all types of things, fish, fowl, mammals. They eat berries, uh, fruits, vegetables, whatever's available they eat as they rummage through the woods. Hunting bear, the way I prefer to do it, is bow hunting, camouflage, similar to the deer hunting technique over a spot that you hope will attract or an animal will be passing through. With bears, you have to attract them. Camouflage is important in bear hunting. You don't want the bear to see you unnecessarily, although I'm convinced that oftentimes the bear knows you're there and isn't particularly bothered. I hunt with a recurve bow, 46 pounds, which is plenty accurate and plenty uh, has enough poundage to do the job. The most important thing in hunting, whether it's a gun or a bow, is the placement of the arrow or the bullet, far more important than the type of equipment you use. Fred Bear killed many animals with a bow similar to this, and a lot of hunters have. But the question is, is a bear going to come into the bait? Now, this is a, actually a reenactment of my opening day hunt. This is how I walked into the stand with my day pack, with all the gear I needed, uh, with my bow and arrows. I checked the bait before I went in to see if there was any indication that a bear had hit it earlier in the morning or the previous night. Now, whether it did or not really doesn't make a whole lot of difference because they'll often hit the bait intermittently. So you sit up in the tree stand, cross your fingers, and hope one comes by. I'm hunting here in what you'll recognize as more of a permanent tree blind, one that can be re removed from the tree with nails, but actually this is illegal to use on any state or federal public land. It's only legal on private land. So when you see us hunting from uh, platforms like this, you know we're hunting on private land. I dress up in the camouflage using an insect suit because insects are far more of a problem early in September than trying to keep warm is. And this camouflaged me and uh, kept the bugs away. One important thing I think that bow hunters should use when they're hunting for bear and deer is a tracking device, a string tracker. This game tracker I use spools from the inside. The thread will uh, be attached to my arrow. When I hit a bear or a deer, it will run out, the thread will peel out almost effortlessly. It can go hundreds of yards and it makes it easy to find the bear, uh, especially in these conditions. I told you in the UP, especially the western UP, there's a lot of rain in early September particularly. So this tracking device at dark can be very helpful in recovering bears. The evening I was on the stand, about six o'clock, there he came through the woods, my heart pounded a Michigan bear. The bear that I saw wasn't quite as big as Boo Boo's. Probably 150, 175 pounds, and this bear right now we're looking at weighs about 300. I found I was able to move in the tree stand. I was sort of testing the bear. A 175 pounder is a little smaller than, than I was interested in, and frankly, I enjoyed watching how it reacted. Now right here, sniffing me. One of the first things the bear did when he came in was look at the tree stand, look at me, sniff. My wind was blowing towards the bait. The air was, was carrying my scent and I was convinced the bear knew I was there because he looked up at me four or five times. Now, the bear didn't move the logs like this the first time it came in, the smaller one, and oftentimes bear will avoid any big movements of the logs if they can scavenge around the edges. He's pawing right there for some meat and for some of the molasses, the bread. Uh, a bear doesn't come into the bait ravagingly hungry. Uh, he finds a lot to eat in the woods. They're omnivorous. They eat almost anything they can find. They take their time. Now the way this bear is, is acting is exactly like the wild bear acted. Of course, this bear is not really tame. It's semi-tame, I guess you'd call it. But bears in the woods like this seem to be uh, almost unconcerned about the presence of man. If you don't let the bear see you and scare the bear in that fashion, oftentimes they can smell you, know you're there, but they're used to human scent. This is why you'll find bears in Yellowstone Park, on the roads, uh, even in Michigan in different places. They've been out on the roads with their cubs uh, begging for food. Bear are not as afraid of the scent of a man as, say, a deer is, that is continually nervous when it's in front of your stand. In fact, continually nervous year-round from all sorts of threats. Bears are a threat to deer, small deer. Bears are also an extreme threat to other small bears. The reason a sow bear is so protective of her cubs is because she's afraid of one thing. There's only one thing in the woods, really, that can eat her cubs and provide a threat, and that is a big boar. And every year, um, more cubs are killed and eaten by boar bears than any other single threat. 
We're, he's moving now to the tripe that's in the tree, which sometimes they'll eat it, sometimes they won't, but they sniff everything. Bear is continually sniffing because his eyesight is so poor. Can't see too well, but he's so strong, so muscular, that he has very little to fear in the woods. The bear that was in front of me three separate times. It came in at about six o'clock, rummaged around the bait, looked at me. The second time is when I clicked the pictures, and about two or three times when I was clicking pictures, he looked up towards me, but uh, he didn't seem bothered. So this is actually, I was amazed when we turned Boo loose through the woods like this, how totally natural he appeared. But as I said, they don't have much to fear, and they're natural whatever they do. But they do sniff a lot, they look around and they amble. They'll spend uh, many miles every day just walking, moving, exercising that muscular body. But it's an excitement, bear hunting is an excitement that can't be equaled. The meat, I told you a, a boar bear and a sow bear, those are terms we apply to pigs. Their meat tastes somewhat like pork. It's tasty, we're gonna show you a recipe in just a few minutes. But this bear provided an adventure to me in the woods that I won't soon forget. Bear hunting season is still open in the Upper Peninsula, and uh, archery deer season just opened this past Monday. I have Bill Swagler on the phone. Bill, what have you heard about the archery success? Uh, Fred, it looks real good. I didn't do too well, of course. I didn't, didn't. see a lot up in the Harrison area, but uh, right now the population is excellent. There's a lot of deer out there. Guess, uh, right now I'm holding my hat with my finger through the top. You missed. Yeah, I missed. That's right. I set my head up there, and we had some pretty good shots in camp. We had a good hunt. I'm going to be reporting on that on next week's show. Could you give me a real quick rundown in just a few seconds here on the salmon? I sure can, Fred. It has been a little slow, but as the weather cools, it's going to get a lot better. The Ludington area is still good. 800 fish yesterday. The UP's got some nice perch in the Lashino area, and Harrisville's a hot spot on the east side. Okay. Well, super. For those who want to get out fishing, we're going to be hunting next week. And, Bill, if you haven't had too much luck, I suggest you watch this show. I will. Thanks for the info. We'll talk to you next week. Okay, bye. Okay, now we're going to get on to some outdoor headlines, some good news for deer hunters from Bob Garner. Well, it's not really good news yet, but it could be good news for handgun deer hunters, those that want to hunt the southern half of the Lower Peninsula with a handgun this year. There is some talk that the Senate will come back into session on November 13th, two days before the gun deer season, okay the handgun deer hunting bill for this season yet, and the governor might sign an emergency copy of that bill that night. So it's going to be close and right down to the wire. Antlerless permits are up, believe it or not. They had an earlier date, but they are up 10%, the applications this year. Elk permit applications already number as of yesterday 28,000. So you've got a 1 in 560 chance of getting an elk permit, even as we speak right now. Closing date on that is October 15th. Duck season opened throughout most of the state of Michigan last uh, weekend. Last Saturday, it was a pretty good season. Birds were a little more scarce than they usually are. Teal made up a good portion of the kill. Uh, fantastic day to be out, though. It was a nice bluebird morning. Not really one, one of those days, as you think of, as good duck weather. But it does open in southeast Michigan this Saturday. That's uh, October 6th. This Saturday opens in southeast Michigan. The duck hunting opener up around Cadillac was a little bit slow for us, but we did get some good videotape. That's another tough kind of hunting to film. That'll be coming up October 18th. So if you're a duck hunter, tune into that show. We'll do the best we can to bring you some duck hunting action. Ed, let's answer some questions in our mailbag. All right, from Barbara Knightsel of Plymouth. She writes, while camping last October, I ran across piles of acorns. They were neatly piled on the fire trails. They were too neat to be blown off a tree, and I doubt they were deer stash out in the open like that. Were they deer bait by hunters? I'm stumped. Please yeah. explain. Yeah, I don't think they were deer stash. I don't know how deer could make piles like that. There's acorns all over the woods, so deer hunters really wouldn't take any interest in scooping up acorns, and they wouldn't put them in a fire trail anyway, or under most circumstances. Um, it stumped Glenn Dutter and I, too. We thought that it could possibly be red squirrels. Now, fox squirrels, gray squirrels, uh, squirrels cash nuts, but particularly red squirrels. And they'll, they'll hide them under stumps and things, not usually out in the open. But Glenn said it was probably the wind or water from rain would collect the acorns. They'd float along, and they'd go into depressions in the road. And then when the water evaporated, there were the acorns. That's the best we can come up with. Mm -hmm. I don't, maybe Sounds kids good. did it. Probably, you know, it could very yeah. well be kids collecting them and setting them there. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Got another question here for you. We got this over the phone. If I put up my own tree stand on public land and leave it overnight or during the day, what happens if I go out to hunt but find someone else in it? Do I have a legal right to kick him out? 
You could tell him you do. I mean, that might uh, somebody might be impressed with that, but legally, no, you do not. Uh, when you set up a blind in the woods, whether it's a tree stand, a temporary tree stand, whether uh, it's something that is uh, constructed on the ground, whether it's a duck blind out in a marsh, Bob Garner, what's the answer? What if somebody is sitting in that blind that is yours? Oh, you have no legal right to kick him out. You are on public, if, if, if it is indeed on public land. However, you do have a right to request your tree stand back. Mm -hmm. So he can stay in the tree or whatever, but you can get your tree stand back. That's the rule. That's the way it is. And that is why for many years, Ron Bacon and I, when we hunted, we got up earlier than anybody opening day of deer season because we put too much time in our blinds, you know, setting them up. And we watched the flashlights in the woods, and when we saw the first ones coming out in the woods and claim our, our uh, blind, because mm -hmm. it really technically is not yours, it's just where you're sitting. You just have to right. use a, really a lot of common sense in these matters. That's, that's right. But that, that's the story on that. You do not have a legal right. Now, here's a question for you folks. See what you know about duck hunting and all the duck stamps and things that we have that we buy, especially duck hunters, it seems. Where does the money go? You know, waterfowl hunters purchase over $11 million worth of federal duck stamps each season. Where does this go? What is the money used for? The answer, federal duck stamp sales are used to purchase wetlands for wildlife restoration and propagation within the United States. Something new and different on the griddle, Fred. Bear meat. Bear meat, okay. This is something that Julia Childs has never had <laughs> on her right. cooking program. Okay, that is cooking uh, uh, the most simple recipe in mm -hmm. the world. In fact, why don't you tell all the ingredients right now, Kathy? Bear meat. I bet you wonder where we got bear meat, huh? Well, it wasn't mine or Bob's. That's right. It was <laughs> Dave Bodecker. A good Daniels. friend, right. But what are the ingredients you put on it? Salt and pepper. And, and our bear meat. And that's, that's it. <laughs> the one tip I want to give to all of you hunters, and this really goes for wild game of all sorts, is take the fat off. Now we're going to try some. We have some on the grill with the fat on it, but most of the fat we're going to remove because this is the, the part of a bear that gives it the strong taste. Not only the fat that's on the outside, and this is back strap, this is like the loin, but we're going to take out some of these inside, uh, the tendons, the fell. This can be strong tasting. That's Venison, all we're, venison, right? That's right. It, that is the strong tasting ingredient in almost any meat. That's all we're going to do. We have it on the grill right now. In fact, it's about due to be flipped Should over, be Kathy. Turned. Right. We'll flip that over and take a taste of it, but first let's take a peek at our trophy report. Here's a drawing of a fish that's going to have to do because people who catch this species don't very often get their picture taken with it. It's a moon eye, not real common in Michigan, but six-year-old Brian Phillips of Rochester caught one on a minnow last year on October 1st, and at one pounds, two ounces, it set the state record. Now, moon eye aren't good to eat if they're cooked fresh. They're dry and full of small bones, but they're supposed to be good smoked. Brian, you could have had your picture on Michigan Outdoors, but congratulations on the state record nonetheless. And here's a September salmon that's quite impressive. 32 pounds of Chinook caught by David Paz of Wordsmith Air Force Base. Naturally, he caught it in the Asable, casting a little Cleo just a few weeks ago. The Master Angler of the Week title is going to a salmon and salmon angler that, well, this salmon really looks bigger, but it's actually a pound and a half smaller and a half inch shorter than the previous one. Young Roger Deaton from Oxford caught it on a J-plug trolling in Lake Huron a few weeks ago, and the way he's holding it in front of the camera makes it look huge. Nice photo, Roger. So we're going to make you our King Salmon Fisherman Master Angler of the Week. Time to turn the grill off, reveal, ta-da, right. grilled good. bear. This is going to be super. Now, Kathy, we have some down there on the plate. Why don't you guys dig in and, and okay. go ahead and make your choices to whether you want some with fat on it or without. But this smells mighty good, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. How is it? Tender. But is it tasty? Oh yeah, I like it. I've had beer. Have you had beer before? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I've had it. Way, on the oh, grill. Mm -hmm. I've had it in wild game dinners where it's soaked and marinated and everything else, mm. and it isn't nearly as good, I think, as this. Ouch! That's hot. Mmm. Delicious. Did you have some with the fat on it? Well, I'm not sure. I didn't. I didn't see any fat on any of these pieces. What about you, Bob? Mm-hmm. I had uh, just a little bit of piece with the uh, the fat on it, but. You know, I shot a bear about three years ago with a bow and arrow, and my wife keeps saying, go back and bear hunt. It's good <laughs> yeah. stuff. Go back yeah. and do it. Mm -hmm. Oh, it is. 
In fact, the fat right here, we can see a piece right here that has the fat on it. It looks sort of like a pork steak, but this tastes more like beef. This is the loin, mm -hmm. the back strap. This fat is very mild. For the rest of the bear, though, especially around the arms, the shoulders, the chuck, you want to cut all of the fat off in connective tissue, but on the loin, it really isn't necessary. Uh, Fred, just pass that one. More, you want that one? Thank you. Okay, that's good. Kathy, can I borrow your fork sure a second? Sure can. This is just terrific. It does. It tastes like beef, and I think mm -hmm. anybody out there would be absolutely amazed. Change mm -hmm. your attitude towards bear hunting. Oh, but yeah, you know, absolutely. You're, you're right on this recipe. The simpler, the better. It's a lot right. of wild game. Mm -hmm. That's the truth. Recipe, by the way, is in the Club Digest. Write to us for the address coming up at the end of the show. Right now, Ed? Let's go to the Michigan Outdoors Outdoor Calendar. That bear recipe, by the way, was rated by the studio crew as excellent. They all said it tasted like sirloin steak, which goes to show that wild game doesn't taste nearly as wild as people think. It's all in the preparation and the cooking. The trick is to keep it simple. You know, Michigan black bears are quite common throughout the state. The DNR manages the bear population. Uh, hunters take about 900 to 1,000 a year. Doesn't affect the population at all. This past summer we had a good berry crop, so the number of complaints of nuisance bears was low, but most years bears do cause problems, sometimes serious ones in various parts of the state. Join us next week for an opening day bull hunt for deer at the Lost Arrow Lodge. You'll see lots of deer, and whether you hunt or not, hopefully you're going to learn something you didn't know about deer and deer hunting. That's next Thursday, Michigan Outdoors, right here on PBS. Production of Michigan Outdoors is made possible in part by the Stroh Brewery Company, a family-owned brewery, and its distributors throughout Michigan.